Hey, I, I wanted to let you guys know a couple things coming up. Uh, first of all, uh, next Sunday is our Table Sunday. Uh, if you're not aware and haven't been to Living Rock before, uh, I think I can look around and say most of you have and you understand what next Sunday is. What I always want to remind and say is the opportunity is once a month we take this time not only to meet in these groups around tables to focus on really caring and loving one another as well as learning and growing through discussion. But also on that Sunday, we take time to baptize. And so I want to remind you that if you've not been baptized, I would encourage you to take that step. And if you want to be baptized, we do it once a month on that Sunday. And so if anybody feels prompted, you have not taken that first step of obedience and following the Lord, then I would encourage you to do that. Just have a conversation with me afterwards, and I'd love to, to baptize you this next Sunday. So that kind of coincides with our table Sundays and baptism. But that'll be next Sunday. And those conversations are always great. My kids actually now, they all say, we love the table Sundays the best. I said, yeah, because of the food. They're like, no, actually, we really just enjoy hearing other people sharing and what they're learning. And, and so that's been great. I thought, oh, really? Is it the food? Or, but no, they said the discussion. So I don't know. But there's good food, too. Um, if you have one of these cards, I don't know if you got one on your way in. If you didn't, you can, you're welcome to grab it. These are great reminder cards, but even more so, they're great for inviting and saying, hey, we'd love to see you on Easter. You know, it's a one Sunday a year, or maybe two with, with Christmas, where people who don't normally come to church may come. And I know that a lot of times it can feel like, well, they just come and then they never come back. But we don't know what the Lord can do in that one moment. And so we believe that God may, may want to change them, that they may come to salvation, and that may be the step towards a relationship with him that they need. So I want to encourage you, use these not only as a reminder, but to invite. There's Easter morning service, and on the back you can see our Good Friday service, which is uh, with, our, with other churches in the community. It's going to be at ACC Church, Anacortes Christian Church. It's at 5 and 7. Uh, as well as there is an art walk, a reflection art walk at CTK from 12 p.m. to 8 p.m. that day on Good Friday. Really great. If you didn't go to it the last couple years, it's an awesome opportunity just to reflect on art that walks or kind of comes through Good Friday, Last Supper, all the way through his death on the cross and different art stations that help you just reflect on that, and they receive communion at the end. So I encourage you, Good Friday, to take advantage of those things in our community, as well as the service at 5 and 7. Well, this morning, I uh, threw a little curveball to Jeff last week. I said, hey, this week's looking a little crazy. Would you mind stepping in to speak? My my grandmother, who was 103, she passed away a couple weeks ago, so she got lots of extra years, but we got to go back and uh, just a memorial for her. It was a really neat time together with family, but because of that, I was like, hey, Jeff, would you mind um, so I can really just focus there? And so he has uh, graciously uh, said yes, and, and he will be speaking this morning. He's going to be sharing on the spiritual realm. And I wanted to say this because a couple of the visuals, I was like, I even asked him. I, it was funny yesterday. I was like, Jeff, that's a little weird. Like, what is that visual? And he's like, actually, that's what the scripture says. And I looked at the scripture and I looked at it. And I'm like, yeah. So you will see some of that this morning. And I don't want to catch you off guard. But I also think that it's really good because these are people's uh, way that they are trying to imitate or or. Um, give words or pictures, I'm sorry, to the words of Scripture. And he has some great visuals in that way, but he's going to be talking about the spiritual realm. So would you welcome up Jeff this morning as we begin? Are we on? Hey. Oh, wait. One, One thing. Yeah. If you don't know Jeff and you haven't been here when he's spoken, I'd encourage you to get your uh, scripture list. If you have that with you, you're going to get a lot of scripture and it's great. So write down the notes, get ready to flip through the Bible. Does anybody That's need it. a scripture list? We have them out front. Can I have someone? Great. Thank you, Katrina. Good morning. Yeah, he did catch me off guard a little bit. Uh, he said, but uh, actually, I had, uh, I had prayed about this, oh, about three, four months ago and asked the Lord, is there, you know, I, I got the word, be ready in season and out of season. And of course, even with this, I said, uh, Lord, what do you want me to preach on? So 
Do we have the first slide? I want to make sure we're up and running. There we go. Angels, demons, and spiritual warfare. This was a subject that has been addressed in I don't know how many books. How many books there have been on angels, how many on demons, and how many on spiritual warfare. So in 25 minutes, I'm not going to be able to cover everything that they have. But I hope to give you enough to um, understand that God wants us to know that we are victorious in Jesus. Amen. We're going to start with 2 Kings 6.16. So Elisha answered and said, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, Open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses, chariots, and of fire all around Elisha. Revelations 5.11 says, Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the numbers of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and a thousand thousands. Now, I heard a, a pastor preach on this once, and he went, you know, that's a hundred billion angels. Afterwards, a, a, a teacher, mathematics teacher, came up to him and says, uh, Pastor, you were wrong. It wasn't a hundred billion. He says, you know, I thought that was too much. He says, no, it wasn't enough. Ten times four, ten to the fourth times ten to the fourth times ten to the third times ten to the third is 100 trillion. We have 100 trillion angels on our side. The Bible says that Satan drew away one-third of the angels. That means that there are 50 trillion demons. So the good, num good angels outnumber the fallen angels two to one. Now, this is going to become uh, more evident when we go on here. So who are the angels? The first ones mentioned, Genesis 3.24, are the cherubim. So he drove out the man, and he placed a cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. And also, as well, there's cherubim mentioned in Exodus, Exodus 25, talking about the Ark of the Covenant and how the angels were put on the, on the uh, call it the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. Next would be the seraphim, Isaiah 6.2. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. Now, personally, I am not going to try to explain is, uh, Ezekiel. Go ahead and put the next slide, please. If you ever read Ezekiel chapter 1, that's a pretty good artist rendition of what he saw, Ezekiel saw. So I'm, I'm just going to leave it at that. I mean, read it for yourself. Archangels, Jude 1.9, yet Michael the archangel contended with the devil. Also Daniel 10.12, then he said to me, do not fear Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Now, only two archangels are named in the Bible. Michael is the warrior, and Gabriel is the messenger. Now, although Gabriel is not directly mentioned as an archangel, 1 Thessalonians 4.16 says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. And since Gabriel is a messenger, I believe he is an archangel. There may be more, but they're not named. Other angels... Revelations 10, verse 1, I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was on his head, and his face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. Then in Revelations 5, 2, we have a strong angel. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose the seals? Now one thing to note Angels will never receive worship, but direct worship to God. 
Revelations 22, 8, and 9. Now I, John, saw and heard these things, and when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Then he said to me, See that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant and of your brethren the prophets and of those who keep the words of this book. Worship God is his message. Now Satan and demons. Now realize Satan and demons have been cast out of heaven. They are fallen angels with limited abilities. And remember, we've overcome the devil by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. We resist the devil, we draw close to God, and the, de the devil flees from us. Now, you heard me share this before, but it bears repeating. Who bound Satan and who cast him into the bottomless pit? Revelations 20, verses 1 through 3. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should not deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. Now, you heard me talk about the strong angel, the mighty angel, the cherubim, seraphim, and here we have an angel. Now, for those English majors out there, an is an indefinite article meaning nonspecific. Now, if we ever had an angel appear, personally, I don't think it would be nonspecific. <laughs> but here, by definition, they're not calling him any other kind of angel, but just an angel. So I lightly say a non-specific angel. And he bound Satan and he cast him into the bottomless pit. And we have a hundred million of them on our side, our trillion on our side. Praise God. Now the fall of Lucifer, Isaiah 14, starting in verse 12. How are you fallen from heaven, Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations? For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the furthest side of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. His, his sin? Pride. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol. To the lowest depths of the pit, those who see you will gaze at you and consider you, saying, Is this the man who made the earth to tremble and who shook kingdoms, who made the world as a wilderness and destroyed its cities, who did not open the house of his prisoners? Now Jesus says of Satan in John 8, 44, You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. Now, Satan has convinced everyone that he is more than he is. Did I get that one? Next, next one, please. For no, 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. for no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light, but he is not all-powerful, omnipresent, all-knowledgeable, omnipotent. These are lies he, have, he has foisted upon people to believe, and he is not. And one of the things to remember, he is, he is not everywhere. He is a single being stuck in one place, Satan was, a, was and is a sinner from the beginning, 1 John 3, 18. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Can I get an amen on that one? Amen. Satan has power and hides in darkness, Acts 26, 18, to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Remember, Satan's number one tool is deception. Also, John 10.10, 10, the first part says, he is also a murderer, a thief, 
and a destroyer. Now, tools and the tricks, deceptions and lies of the enemy. Isaiah 5.20. This is one that has been on my heart for the last year because of all the things that are going on in our culture, and our society today. And this is a scripture that I uh, apply to that. Woe to those who call evil good, and good evil. Who put darkness for light, and light for darkness. Who put bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. Who call criminals victims, and who call victims criminals. Who call male, female, and male, female, and female, male? The devil knows my name, but calls me by my sin. Jesus knows my sin until I repent, but calls me by my name and gives me a new name. And this is not on the overhead, but... 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, God is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Satan calls me a sinner. God calls me forgiven. Who are you going to believe? Satan, the deceiver, his number one tool is deception. He is a liar. This is how Satan wants you to view him. That's how big strong, ugly, bat-winged horns. That's how he wants us. Genesis 3, 4 says, and these are, two, these are his first two lies. Genesis 3, verse 4, you will, be, you will not certainly die. Verse 5, you will be like God, knowing good from evil. Remember, he is the father of lies. But this is more like what he looks like. This is more like Isaiah 14. I'm going to read Isaiah 14, verse 16 from The Voice. People peer down at you from above, and their curiosity overflows. People, wow, is this the man who once terrorized the world? Is this the one who rocked the earth's kingdoms and threatened us with disaster? With disaster? He's a liar. He's not that big, huge demon, but we're going to look at him and go, I shared this with Tim beforehand. The King James says, they will narrowly look upon you. I always got, how do you narrowly look? And I went, really? That is going to, that did all of, all the problems that we have? He's a liar. His, he's a deceiver. Another life, 2 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 3. But I fear lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not pre- preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. Remember, the deceiver is not all present, powerful, knowing, seeing, and oh, by the way, neither are we. But we serve the God, the risen Savior, the Holy Spirit, who is all present, all powerful, all knowing, all seeing, and most important of all, all love. Thank you, Jesus. So here are some biblical examples of what we can do for spiritual warfare. The first thing is, ask for wisdom. James 1.5, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God, who gives to all liberally without reproach, and it will be given him. Pray for wisdom on how to do spiritual warfare. Ephesians 6.12, remember, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, and against the rulers of darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. We pray for people. We pray against the enemy. 
There, I got my two Tim hand gestures in. <laughs> don't, don't laugh too hard, Steve. 2 Corinthians 10, 4, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty. Mighty. Did I say mighty? Mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Forgiveness is a spiritual warfare. 2 Corinthians 2, verses 9 through 11. Another reason I wrote to you was to see if you would stand the test and be obedient in everything. Anyone you forgive, I also forgive. And what I have forgiven, if there is anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, lest Satan should take advantage of us. Forgiveness is a spiritual weapon, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So how am I, how am I to prepare for spiritual warfare? Well, the first thing is, of course, anybody. Anybody. Prayer. And the second thing is Bible. 2 Timothy 2.15 in the Amplified. Study and do, not, and do your best to present yourself to God, approved, a workman, tested by trial, who has no reason to be ashamed, accurately handling and skillfully teaching the word of truth. You handle the truth and the lie becomes obvious. Now, examples of how to pray. 2 Samuel 5.31, 15.31, Then someone told David, saying, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. And David said, O Lord, I pray, turn the counsel of Ahithophel, turn the counsel of the enemy, into foolishness. 2 Chronicles 20, verses 20 through 22. So they rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord, who should praise the the beauty of holiness, as they went out before the army and were saying, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endures forever. Now when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, against the enemy who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. Exodus 23, 27, I send my fear before you. I will cause confusion. Where? In the enemy's camp. Among all the people to whom you come and will make your enemies turn their backs to you. Now for those of us that were in the military, when the enemy turns your back to you, that's totally advantageous. Lifting hands is spiritual warfare. Exodus 1711. And so it was when Moses held up his hands that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hands, Amalek, the enemy, prevailed. And Paul admonishes Timothy in 1 Timothy 2.8, I desire therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and without doubting. Shouting the high praise of God is spiritual warfare. Joshua 6.20, so the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets, and it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down. We want the walls of the enemy to fall down. We want those prison gates to fall down. Now, I'm going to read all of Psalm 149, and I want you to see where the spiritual warfare comes in here. Psalm 149. Sing to the Lord a new song and his praises in the assembly of the saints. Let Israel rejoice in their maker. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let them praise his name with the dance and let them sing praises to him with the timbrel and harp. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the humble with salvation. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud on their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouths and a two-edged sword in their hand. To do what against the enemy? To execute vengeance on the enemy. To punish 
the enemy, to bind the enemy with chains and with fetters of iron, and to execute on the enemy the written judgment. And this bottom line, second to the bottom line, always got to me. This honor have all the saints. And the last line, praise the Lord. Now, we're going to do a little bit of practical application real quick, if we might. And so, the Bible says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty and freedom. So, let's stand, please. When Moses was at the Red Sea, he said, stand and see the salvation of God. Stand and see. So, we've already seen that praise and worship is spiritual warfare. Now, there's many examples in the book of Psalms, but I'm just going to go through a couple. Psalms 47.1 says, clap your hands, all you people. So we clap our hands. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. The other part of 47, though, right after that says, shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Philippians 2 says, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. 2 Corinthians 15, 57 says, thanks be to God who gives us the victory in our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, God, for the victory. When Jesus was tempted, he responded with scriptures to put the enemy to flight. So praising God with scripture, we can also put the enemy to flight. Revelations 4, 6 and Isaiah 6, 3. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Let's do that again. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Revelations 5, 11, Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Isaiah, Psalm 150, let everything that has breath stay very quiet and subdued. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let's put it all together now, all of it. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We bless you, Lord, and you put the enemy to flight. Amen. Amen. If you don't praise, the stones will cry out. But that's okay, because guess what? We are living stones. 1 Peter 2.5, you, you, you are living stones, being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, I heard you say it already, but how about a little louder? Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated. More prayers from the Old Testament against the enemy. And it, uh, Nehemiah 4.15. And it happened when our enemies heard it that it was known to us that God had brought the enemy's plot to nothing. Judges 7, 19 through 22. Obedience to God puts the enemy to flight. So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outpost of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, just as they had posted the watch. And they blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers that were in their hands. Then the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers, they held, and they held torches in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands for blowing, and they cried, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And every man stood in his place around the camp. And the result of being obedient... I mean, here's, here's again, military people. Here's your battle strategy. Take a pitcher in one hand and a torch in the other and break the pitcher. That's your battle strategy. And what happened to the enemy? The whole army ran and cried out and fled. And when the 300 blew the trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his command, command, companion throughout the whole camp, and the army fled. 
Praise God. The enemy fled. Psalm 715 says, And he made a pit and dug it out and has fallen into the ditch which he made. His trouble shall return upon his own head and his violent dealing shall come down on his own crown. Now we talked about this, but I'm going to reemphasize that the weapons of our warfare are spiritual. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 6 in the message says, The world is unprincipled. It's dog-eat-dog out there. The world doesn't fight fair. But we don't live or fight our battles that way. We never have, never will. The tools of our trade aren't for marketing or manipulation, but they are for demolishing the entire massively corrupt culture. We use our powerful God tools for smashing warped philosophies, tearing down banners erected against the truth of God, fitting every loose thought and emotion and impulse into the structure of life shaped by Christ. Our tools are ready at hand for clearing the ground of every obstruction and building lives of obedience into maturity. Amen. Ephesians 2, we are familiar with. The weapons of our warfare, starting in verse 10. Fi finally, brethren, brothers and sisters, draw your strength and might from God. Oh, by the way, this is, this is from the voice. Put on the full armor of God to protect yourselves from the devil and from his evil schemes. We are not waging war against enemies of flesh and blood. No, this fight is against tyrants, against authorities, against supernatural powers and demon princes that slither in the darkness of the world and against wicked spiritual armies that lurk about in heavenly places. And this is why you need to be head to toe in the full armor of God so you can resist during these evil days and be fully prepared to hold your ground. Yes, stand. Truth banded around your waist. Righteousness as a chest plate. Feet protected in preparation to proclaim the good news of peace. And don't forget to raise the shield of faith above all <coughs> else, so you will be able to extinguish the flaming spears hurled at you from the wicked one. Take also the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray always. Pray in the Spirit. Pray about everything in every way you know how. And keeping all this in mind, pray on behalf of God's people. Keep on praying feverishly and on the look, be on the lookout until evil has been stayed. Now, when I read this in the voice, I also noticed that there was um, a com little commentary written underneath it. So I was duly impressed by this. So I want to read that to you also. So this is a commentary on, uh, from The Voice on Ephesians 6. Paul knows that the real battles and dangers we face are not against flesh and blood. The enemies we see are real enough, but they are animated by spiritual forces of darkness that stay strategically hidden from view. These powers often reveal themselves in institutional evils, genocide, terror, tyranny, lawlessness, unbridled hate and anger, deception, lies, and oppression. But the weapons needed to combat them are not earthly weapons at all. What is needed, Paul advises, is to stand firm in God's power and to suit up in the full armor of God. Although the devil and his demon armies are destined for destruction, they are serious threats now and must be resisted and beaten back. For Paul, the best offensive weapons we have are the Word of God, worship, and prayer. Romans 6.20, a great promise. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet. Therefore, when I pray in spiritual warfare, using the Scriptures as an example and praying for the anointing of the Holy Spirit, I have prayed. Lord, turn the counsels of the enemy into foolishness. Lord, set ambushes against the enemy's plans. Lord, send your fear before us and cause confusion in the enemy's camp. God, bring the enemy's plot to nothing. Turn the counsels of the enemy onto himself. Let the enemy fall into the ditches he has dug for me. Lord, 
crush the deceiver under our feet. Remember, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. And the last, put on the whole armor of God, God's truth, God's holiness, God's peace, faith, God's salvation, God's righteousness, and take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, on the back of your card, I put, uh, where, uh, back of the Scripture card, I, I listed all of those on the back there for your, to, to use as inspired. The Holy Spirit inspires and empowers. He never motivates us with fear. You agree? Amen. Second Timothy 1.7 from the Amplified says, For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, of cowardice, of craven and cringing and fawning fear, but he has given us a spirit of power and of love and of a calm and well-balanced sound mind and disciplined, discipline and self-control. So here's a warning, Psalms 12.8, The wicked prowl on every side when vileness is exalted among the sons of men. The answer to that, James 4, 7. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Be disciplined, 1 Peter 5, 8, from the voice. Most importantly, be disciplined and stay on guard. Why? Because your enemy, the devil, is prowling around outside like a roaring lion, just waiting and hoping for a chance to devour someone. Be disciplined. Stay on guard. And the promise, 1 John 4.4, 4, You are of God, little children, and have overcome the enemy, because he who is in you is greater than the enemy who is in the world. So, uh, worship team, could you come up? In closing, Colossians 3, 14 through 17. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you are also called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord, and whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Remember, resist the devil, he will flee from you. My benediction is from 1 Thessalonians 5, starting in verse 16. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. As we begin uh, to worship and a song here, or conclude, I guess. Um, I want to acknowledge that for some of you in that room, like to shout in praise is very out of your norm. Um, and I, I acknowledge that that even might push like, oh, this feels a little bit weird. I don't know what to do with this. We live in a culture that we're often reserved in church. I think that mostly we see that now. Um, and so any sort of loudness, you're like, oh, is that real? Is that or just contrived and, you know, kind of forced? Um, and yet when we read scripture, you would see the full example from kneeling and, and pleading with God in worship to shouting and singing our praises boldly. 
And I think sometimes we can fall into the trap of becoming kind of like, this is, this is only how we express ourselves to God. This is true. This is authentic. That's not real. And I, I think those are things that we have to look at Scripture and say, all of this is a part of our praise. You know, I mean, I've never danced around um, naked, unashamed like uh, David, you know, or uh, in a loincloth, whatever he was wearing, in praise to God. And uh, even his wife said, you look foolish. And he's like, I'd rather look foolish before people than, and, and still know that I'm honoring what God asked me to do. So I just want to say that, that, that if you felt like, oh, this is a little different, we have to go to scripture and say, Lord, then teach me how to worship you in that way. Help me to be more free to just praise you. We're going to sing this song, and uh, it's the Battle Belongs. Would you stand as we sing this this morning?
conclude in this way there's something about physical posture that puts us in a place to say God we're submitted to you but our hands are also lifted up so if you can would you sing that kneeling and lifting your hands to the Lord because that is the posture we come humbly to say God you have to move and you have to work let's sing that one more time together so when I find Father, we come kneeling before you to acknowledge your greatness. To think that we have any part in the battle is ignorance and pride. That we think we are going to make the difference. Jesus. It's only you. Yes. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Would you stir us to be a church that prays, that comes to you and says, God, you have to fight this battle. It's not by might, not by power, but by your spirit that things change, that hearts are transformed, that the enemy is defeated. And so would this posture, would this place be known to us, familiar, because we are a people, a church that prays. <clears throat> And may that stir in us life and joy, knowing the battle is won. That greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Amen. Glory, Jesus, glory. You do the fighting for me. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you. In you, there's always victory. So we know that there is a spiritual battle. We know that that's the war that we, we face, God, and the people around us, they're not the enemy. And we pray that your truth would be known, that lies would be dispelled, and that we would be a people that trust and honor you. So thank you. Would you stand as we conclude this time together? Let's lift our hands to the Lord. Father, we come and we say thank you for your goodness today. Thank you for your word that guides us into all truth. And may we be a church and a people that holds to your truth above all else. Thank you for the message spoken through Jeff today. May your word not return void, 
but accomplish this work in our hearts today. And we thank you for this, Father, and we love you. In your name, Jesus, we pray. And everybody said? Amen. 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 Well, guys, thank you. Yes. Use this as we Thank you guys for coming this morning, and I didn't mention this before, but I wanted to say thank you to all you who came out and uh, were working outside yesterday. I know I was talking to some of you, sore backs and all, but I did a good job, and so thankful that you, we'd have a church that just comes, serves, steps in when needed, we work together, we're the body of Christ, and um, it's a blessing to get to be a part of this church, so. Love you guys. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.